Some time ago, the elders encouraged us, really the elders asked us to be a part of something that is good, to do something that could make a difference. And that one thing was to spend some time each week, every week, inviting one person to East Hill. I've thought about that. I've thought about that encouragement from them since the time they stood before us and asked us to do that. I know most of you are doing that, and I think that's a wonderful thing. I know some of you are finding two or three a week to talk about that could come to be with us here at East Hill. And that's a good thing. But what I want you to do with me tonight is focus on something. I believe it's very important. Matter of fact, I might even say it's crucial to what we do, to who we are, and to what we'll do in the future. I want you to focus with me on a lesson entitled before we reach the lost. Because I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, there is a number of things that the Christian needs to do before we reach out to those in our community who need to know the Lord. I believe every one of us knows that as you go to passages like Matthew chapter 28, 19 through 20, that we know that it is our responsibility to go throughout the world and and the commandment given there was to go, not how we need to go, but, but what we're going to do when we go. And as we go out into the world to teach, and our teaching should bring people to baptism, and after baptism we should continue teaching people. I think that we understand that Christianity, that you and I were taught how to be Christians from God's Word. I don't think we argue that fact. I think that we know that there are passages like 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, where Paul is encouraging Timothy to be strong in the grace that's found inside of Jesus Christ, and he is to take the things that he has heard and teach them to others so that they can turn around and teach others. I think it's evident as you look at Scripture that every person that is a Christian, every one of us that are Christians, have the responsibility, and maybe it's deeper than the responsibility. It's deeper than an obligation. I think we should call it a privilege to talk to others about the faith, to talk to others about eternity. I don't know if we consider this very often, but, but eternity seems so far from now, doesn't it, sometimes? You know, day in and day out, life seems to be here and it's until, and it's really until tragedy seems to strike close to our lives or strikes in our nation that we realize, boy, life is short. But you see what we get the privilege to do? We get the privilege to talk to people about eternity. Even passages like Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, which tells us that we could be in a very bad situation. Paul writing to those in Hebrews. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. That's another study in and of itself. But he said, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need to be taught again. You see, we should be sure of what we know. And there's a great way to be sure of what you know. Can I give you my little secret of why I'm not scared to preach? Do you want to know? I'm going to tell you if you don't want to know anyways. Do you know what my little secret is? of Bible classes, Bible articles, radio and television programs, sermons, lectureship manuscripts, presenting those manuscripts. You, know you know what the secret to all of those things is? Oh, it's so simple. You're probably overthinking it right now. There it is. That's my secret. The Lord is not expecting us to come up with something new. The Lord is not expecting us to find a new way. Remember, Jesus says, I am the way. The way has already been declared. The information has already been given. And to beat all, 
You ever thought about this? It's been written down for you and me. It's been put in a volume of which is searchable. And, and you know, we live in the greatest age that I believe that's ever come. Now, this great age comes with great responsibility. Don't get me wrong. But you want to search a Bible word in today? You, know, you can pull out your phone and you can search the Bible words that we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at five Bible words tonight, but, but you can pull out your phone and you can open a Bible application and you can see what that original word. We've never lived in an easier time to study God's Word, to have God's Word, to talk about God's Word. We've never lived in a better time. Now, with certain things comes great responsibility. As good as things like this can be, can't they be so dangerous? You know, we need to be prepared to know that. They can be dangerous in a number of areas, but if we use them appropriately, we live in the greatest age it's ever been because of the ease that it is to study God's Word. And we should never be in a position of which we have need to be taught again. Those first principles of the oracles of God, Hebrews 5.12. So what I want you to do with me, it won't take us long to do, is look at three things. Number one, we're going to take an exam. We've done this before, but this is a different exam. I keep finding tests in the Bible, and, and this one I've always known about, and you know about it. If you think hard enough, you'll know right where we're going. But you just keep thinking, I'll tell you in a minute. We're going to look in the second place. You've got to prepare for others. You know, if we're going to talk about going out and inviting other people, we've got to prepare ourselves for other people that are going to be around us. And then in the third place, I want us to understand growth. And, and I think that's an interesting word because when you talk about growth, there are two different avenues that you can talk about growth. You can talk about physical numbers, and you can track the attendance of a congregation. You can track baptisms and, and responses of a congregation. And you can see growth in a very limited basis. Because growth is not just about numbers, even though numbers have a lot to do with growth. But you can look at the spiritual maturity of people. And that's where you can see growth. And what I want us to do tonight is I want us to look at ourselves and to see if we are growing, to see if our families are growing, to see as we, as a group of God's people, are going in the direction that we should go. So let's talk about before we reach the world. Here's the first. We take the exam. Go with me to 2 Corinthians. I want you to actually go there. I know this, the verse is on the screen for you, but build that thumb memory up and go to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. I believe that Electronic devices are great, and I have nothing wrong with an electronic Bible, but I think you remember, remember it better when you see it on that page, especially if it's a Bible you keep with you quite often. But in 2 Corinthians 13, read with me verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Let's take the test. And let's examine ourselves. Now you're going to have to do this, and I'm going to have to do this. I want you to see, first of all, in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, this is personal. Now we can make a congregational application of this, but I think it's best tonight if we all decide that we're going to do this in our own minds and we're going to come up with the answers that are going to be on this test that we're going to look at tonight. I want you to look at a series of words in this particular verse. You're going to look at five here and then a few in just a moment. But, but there's five that I need you to see, and this will help you take the test. Examine. The word examine used here in 2 Corinthians 13.5 is a word that means to make trial of or to test the character. So here's what you've got to do tonight. If you read 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves. What we all have to do, you and I both, is take self and put self in the courtroom scene and put self on trial to see if there is enough in our lives to convict us of Christianity. Examine yourselves. Test your character and see what your character looks like. 
There are only two ways your character can look. Your character will either resemble that of Christ or your character will resemble that of the world. So the first word I want you to see, examine. We'll see the word yourself in just a moment. As you follow through, I want you to see what happens. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. If you look at this word, it is a word in its original form that means conviction of truth. But I want to make a little deeper application of that word. Conviction of truth, but it's deeper than that. Examine yourselves whether ye be of the faith. There are two ways faith is used inside of the New Testament. There is one way that talks about our personal faith. And every person, whether you've recognized this or not, has a personal faith or a personal conviction that has come and has brought from your study of God's Word. But in the second place in how it's used inside of Scripture is this way. The faith. There is only one way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is only one church, Jesus said, that he's going to build, and if I quote him, my church. There's only one faith. In other words, there is the faith that is in the system of Christianity. Let me say it this way. Are you a part of the Bible faith? You see, this could bring us to this particular idea, but why do you do what you do? Why do you worship the way you worship? Why are we organized the way that we are organized? Why do we do the things that we do? It's because of we are a part of the faith. So look at what he's saying. Examine yourselves whether ye be part or be in the faith. Not only do you have to examine yourself and put yourself on a trial to see if you can be convicted of your faith, you've got to see if you are in the right faith. There are many faiths in our world. The question becomes, which faith are you a part of? Which truth are you a part of? The third word I want you to see in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, is the word prove. Examine yourselves with you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Test. Examine. But listen to this word. Scrutinize. When you're taking this exam, this test of faith, the faith, scrutinize your life. How are your relationships? How is your marriage? How is your parenting? Listen to this one. This is one we don't talk of often. How is your obedience to the elders? This is one we talked about this morning. How is your tongue? How are your words? How is your life? Now let me get to the nitty gritty of what I believe is happening here in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Prove, test, examine, scrutinize how is your life when no one is looking, when you're at home by yourself? Is there enough evidence to convict you that you are a Christian when nobody's looking? And that's the real hard test of faith. Because it's easy, ladies and gentlemen, to be a Christian at church. It's hard to be a Christian when no one's looking. Scrutinize the secret things that God knows. The fourth word I want you to see is the word know. And this word here used is the word that means to recognize or to understand. Know ye not your own selves. Don't you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Is there enough in your life that you can see that you know about yourself to know whether you're going to pass the exam? But it's deeper than that. Do you know the truth about Jesus? That's what's happening at the end of this verse. How that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates? Do you know about Christ? Do you know enough about Christ? Then there's this last word. It's the fifth word of the verse. Reprobates. It's a word that means fail the test. Now that's the Jonathan definition of this word, but it means unfit. If you're going to examine yourselves whether you be in the faith, and unless and if you fail and you become a reprobate, it means you failed the test. In other words, is there enough in our lives for someone to say, by the way we act, by the way we live, by the way we speak, by the way we do not act, that we are Christians? You see, as you look at this verse, you begin to see these words, and they begin to kind of leap off, at least to me they do. You've got to examine. 
You've got to be in the faith. You've got to prove something. You know, every time you take a written test, you remember this in school? I remember in college, a blue book exam. I always dreaded a blue book exam. If you know what that is, and I don't even know if they still do it now, but you had to go buy the little blue book, and basically it was a couple of sheets of paper stapled with a blue cover on it, and you wrote your test on that. I despised those tests because I had to prove my work. I didn't just need to know the answer. I had to show the answer. That's what we're talking about here. You prove you. And then you see the word no. It's, a, it's personal and reprobates. It's what you could be if you're not inside of Christ. Now, there are a few other words I want you to see. And this is why I say 2 Corinthians 13, 5 is a personal verse. Yourselves, ye, you, ye, you, ye. What does that mean? Well, let me help you. It means you. And to me, it means me. So read the verse again. Examine who? Yourself. Whether who? Ye be in the faith. Prove who? Your own selves. If you didn't believe it, your own selves. He draws it out for us. Know ye, not your own selves. How? That Jesus is in you, except ye be reprobates. Do you see what's happening here? We are a people that must prove ourselves as we are living. So let's take the exam. And there are three questions we're going to answer, and they're all the same question. So in your mind, get your pencil out and get your blue book out. Here's question number one. Are you in the faith? I'm not talking about your personal faith. Are you a part of the New Testament system that Jesus died for? It's a yes or no question. Here's the second question. Same question, different words. Are you in Jesus Christ? If you are in Christ you are in the church. And if you are in Christ and you are in the church, then you are following the Word. So answer the question, are you in Christ? It's the same as saying, are you in the faith? Here's question number three. It's a yes or no answer. Are you in the church? You see, the answer to those questions have to be either all yeses or all noes. There's no way to answer them any differently. So the first thing we have to do before we reach out to the world is take the exam to see what we're inviting people to be a part of. The second thing tonight, which will go much quicker, is we must prepare ourselves for others. Go with me to 1 Peter. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2, 21. I need to know who I'm emulating. I need to know who I'm trying to become, and that is Jesus. I'm trying to live like him. I'm trying to serve like Him. I'm trying to talk like Him. I'm trying to love like Him. I'm trying to be as He was on this earth. That's 1 Peter 2, 21-24. Verse 21, For here unto you were called, or were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in His steps. Pause for a minute. Here's the beauty of the Lord's church. Who are we inviting people to be a part of? It's not me, and it's not you. Who do we want people to be like? We want people to be like Jesus, because he left an example for us that we can walk in his steps. I find that very encouraging, because wasn't Jesus sinless in this life? And because of Jesus, we can be made free from sins. Isn't that incredible to think about? The one who did no evil, the one who did no wrong, the one who had no evil thoughts wants to make us like him. And verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, threatened not, but committed himself to that judgeth righteously, to him that judgeth righteously who his own self bear our sins in, the, in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, who or by whose stripes ye are healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Who are we trying to be like? See, what we have to do is we've got to prepare ourselves. We've got to get ready. Now go ahead and go with me back to 1 Peter while we're here. And let's look at 1 Peter 3. Or go over to 1 Peter 3. Let's correct that. Go over to 1 Peter 3. We're already there. Verse 15. Look at what happens here. 
but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Isn't that interesting? You and I have to be prepared. But what I like about this is, I've got to be prepared for what the world is going to do. Yes, I need to be prepared to give the answer, but I've got to be prepared for who I was called to be. Jesus oftentimes talks about this in his life. And verse 16 says that even if someone speaks evil of you, and they're talking about the conversation of your life, your life, if someone speaks evil of your life, that it'll turn out shame on them because you're living inside of Christ. And what's perplexing, not really perplexing, but is amazing to me is verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing, now listen to this, than evil-doing. It's better for us to be called something that we're not than to die in our sins. Isn't that interesting? It's better for us to suffer than to die in our sins, which tells me about the, the perils of dying in our sins. It's better for us to suffer here and now because of what man can do to us than for us to die in our sins. And ladies and gentlemen, that's you and me preparing for others because if we're going to call people to live like Christ, don't we have to be like Christ? Now go with me to Acts chapter 18. There's something I want us to see. Acts chapter 18. This is actually one of my favorite accounts of two individuals in Acts chapter 18. Because in this you have something that I believe is just, just overlooked from occasion. We don't give it that very often answer and we don't really give it the thought that I believe it deserves. But it's the fact that as you start in verse 24, a, a man who was eloquent in the scriptures was presenting a lesson about the Lord. and He had been instructed in the ways of the Lord, verse 25, and he was fervent in what he did. He spot and to, spot, spot and, or spoke and taught. I'll get that out there. He spoke and taught about the things that he knew about the Lord. and He only knew about the baptism of John. And this is why I say this is very interesting. What you have in Acts 18, verse 24, going down to verse 28, is you have a married couple. Where's that married couple at? You, you look at this inside of verse 26. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla heard, they took him unto them. Where were they? They were at Bible study. Do we recognize what a privilege it is to be at Bible study? Now let me expand this thought with our families. I, I get to see something that you don't get to see. I, I get to see this direction. I, I really wish that I could put a little camera right here and you could see yourself. Because it's very interesting to me of what I get to see. I get to see mothers and fathers with their children. I get to see husbands and wives who sit together. And I start to learn a lot about you. You don't know that I know this, but I start to learn a lot about you. I can learn when your children are in trouble from right where I'm standing. It's not hard to figure out you can tell how the parents look at the children and how the children are looking at the parents. I can tell when you're in a marital spat. Sometimes you sit close. Sometimes you're on a different pew. You're not sitting on different pews. But you get, there's a lot that I can see from here. But would we be like Aquila and Priscilla? Would, would we go to a Bible study and would we make sure that before we left that Bible study, the man who was presenting the lesson had all the facts that he needed? That, to me, is impressive. Because how often do we as families, outside of the regular assembly of the Lord's people, go to a Bible study? Well, that was Aquila and Priscilla. This was outside of the regular. This was an extra occasion. And I don't think we recognize the privilege it is to sit with our families, to be with our families, and to talk about heaven. That's what we're doing tonight. We're talking about heaven, and we prepare for others as we do that. So we take the exam, which I hope you answered yes to the exam. 
We prepare ourselves for others by the way that we live and we follow after Christ. We're ready for anything. But what we need to do is we need to understand growth. Now, there's a series of phrases I want you to see that, that I believe make an impact to the way we're going to look at this. Number one, a strong church will contribute to making strong families. A weak church will contribute to making weak families. Remember how I said we could talk about growth? Growth can, we, we can look at it numerically. Or, or we can look at it, and, and pardon the way I'm going to say this because I don't really know how I need to say it, but you go with me. We can look at it spiritually. We can look at ourselves as families and see what we're doing. Are you weak or are you strong? Well, a strong congregation, a strong church will promote to strong families. But a weak group of people will have weak families. A strong family will contribute to making a strong church. But a weak family will contribute to making a weak church. Do you see how all this is boiling down? You'll really see it here. Strong families are made up of strong individuals. And weak families are made up of weak individuals. So how do you gauge the growth of a congregation? I don't know that there's a test to do that. I've often wondered that. You know, how, how do you gauge the, the spiritual nature of a group of people? And, and how do you determine growth? And the answer is there's no good way to do that, but here is the way to do it. You do it. I must do it for me. You must do it for you. Remember where we started? 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine who? Well, not that family. Boy, isn't it easy when your family's having a good day to look at another family and go, boy, they fell apart today. And isn't it hard when your family's falling apart inside of worship and to look over at the family who's doing well for themselves today? That's different, isn't it? But what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine growth. So we ask this question, how do we grow? I, I was tempted to put on the screen Romans 10, 17, because that's the answer. You know that's the answer, right? That is the answer. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How do you grow in your personal faith and in the faith? It's because of God's word. But it's deeper than that. Titus chapter 3 verse 1 says that if we're going to grow, we've got to be active. In other words, here's a question for you. To tell if you are weak or strong, are you active? Now, I'll say this for the most of you. On a Sunday night amidst a, a thunderstorm with pouring down rain right at the time you were supposed to be here, you were here. And bless you for being here. But are you active? But that has much more to do than just the assembling of God's people. Are you active in the Lord's work? That's the question you're going to have to answer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, do you pray regularly? I love 1 Thessalonians 5.17. You can memorize it. Memorize it with me. Pray without ceasing. That, listen, that's, that's akin to Jesus wept. Pray without ceasing. What's he mean? Keep praying. When? Anytime. Where? Anywhere. What occasion? Any occasion. When do we pray? All the time. A test of your faith and to understand your growth will determine and be determined by, in your personal life and in mine, our prayer lives. Have you prayed today outside of the assembling of God's people? Are you going to pray tonight before you go to bed? Will you pray tomorrow when the assembling of God's people will not be together? On Tuesday, will you pray? You may go all the way to Friday and Saturday. On Wednesday, will you pray? I hope you will at least twice. Three times on Wednesday, we start class with a prayer. We open the devotional with a prayer. Four times, actually. Y'all come on Wednesday and count how many times we pray. You can at least get four in. But are you going to do it Wednesday morning? How about Thursday? Are you going to pray? How about Friday? Saturday? That brings us back to what? Sunday. Now, let me, let me complicate things for a minute. It's easy to pray when life is falling apart. When you're not sure that whatever is going on will resolve itself. When 
when, when you're just in great despair. You know, those are times where really it's easier to pray, isn't it? Because we need the Lord. We know we need the Lord, and we have to have Him because we have to endure. But what about when it's good? Have you ever prayed and just thank God for what you had and not for what's wrong? You'll be astonished if you'll do that. To pray about the good things in life. And you'll be astonished at how many good things are in our lives. How do we grow? We pray. I love to talk to my father. I, I talked about my father today to someone. And I'm going to call him tonight and talk to him about me talking about him to finish that conversation out. I love to talk to my father. What about your heavenly father? There's coming a day when my father won't be here. I know that's coming. I don't know when. I hope it's a long time. Be a day when I can't talk to him. I want to. Do we see our Heavenly Father like that? Every day we can talk to him. Do we talk to him? Even if it's just to say thank you. Pray regularly. And number three, and how do we grow? You've got to do good. It's in Acts 10, verse 38, that's talking about Jesus. And it talks about the good that he went about doing for all the people. What good do you do? I can't answer that for you. Do you do good? I, I believe that's a character marker inside of your growth. Because all of these things, if we're active, if we're praying for others, and if we're doing good, we become less self-centered. You know, to be active in the Lord's work means I'm not worried about me anymore. To pray regularly means I'm worried about everybody in my life and I've got something to pray about and to pray for. And to do good means I'm concerned about my, my community. I'm concerned about the congregation of which I attend. I'm concerned about others. You see, before we reach out to the world, we've got to take the exam and determine whether we're in the faith. Before we reach out to the world, we've got to prepare ourselves for others. And before we reach out to the world, we've got to understand growth. I hope you can grow. I hope you are prepared for others. And I hope that as you took the exam, you answered yes to those three questions that we mentioned. But I've got some good news for you. Real good news. Maybe you're here tonight and you want to reach out to the lost, but you, you, you answered no to those questions a moment ago. I, I want to tell you something that you probably know I'm getting ready to say. It's one of my favorite things I can say. There's water. It's just right behind those blue curtains. I imagine... And I know they picked them because the carpet was blue here, but, but it makes me wonder, you know, why didn't they pick them because it was blue like water? There's water here. And, and if I want to be in Christ, if I want to be in Jesus, if I want to be in the church, I've got to go into the water. If I want to mark those questions off as yeses tonight, I've got to go into the water. And I do that through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. Immersion. To come in contact with the blood of Christ in Acts 2.47 says that the Lord adds to the church daily such as should be or would be or chooses to be saved. Maybe that's you tonight. Towels are ready. Garments are ready. Clothes are ready. We've even got a hair dryer for you. What about you? Are you ready to prepare to reach out to the world because you are ready? Maybe you're a child of God tonight, as I expect most of us are. I know that on Sunday night, you're probably thinking, as maybe some of us are thinking, we just extended the invitation this morning. What has changed? You know, I'm less concerned during the invitation about the day that we're living in, this 24-hour period, than I am the previous days. Maybe you're carrying something with you tonight that you, need to be repent, that you need to repent of that wasn't even in today. Maybe you're carrying some hurt with you that you need to pray about. That was years ago, or maybe it was just yesterday. 
Maybe there's sin in your life that was committed years ago, or maybe it was yesterday. That's what I'm concerned about. I know there's a chance that all of us had the opportunity to sin today. I'm not convinced that's exactly how it works for God's people. Because Sunday's really an easy day, isn't it, for us? It's, it's our best day of the week. Maybe there's something in your life. I, I don't know when it was. You need to determine that. But if you're sitting there thinking, there's something I need to make right with the Lord, well, guess what? There's something in your life. Why don't you make it right with the Lord? Because we have the opportunity together to pray. Remember how we talked about praying and spiritual growth? To pray and to grow and to be forgiven. Maybe that's you tonight. Bill has picked out a, a song for us, and it'll be an excellent song for us to, to think, to determine, to decide to be right with the Lord. Do you need to become a Christian tonight? Water's ready. Need to make your life right with the Lord? The time is now. Let's stand and sing and respond accordingly.